Our final session today is a candid conversation between two titans of the real estate industry. John Gray is the head, is the global head of real estate for Blackstone Group, which is the world's largest private equity manager. Blackstone's real estate business has 94 billion under management and includes ownership positions around the world and across all sectors discussed earlier today, as well as funds that provide both first mortgage and high yield debt. It will not surprise you to learn that John was hired straight out of college, University of Pennsylvania, by Blackstone in 1992. John has been a rising star ever since. I've had the personal pressure of watching his, his career flourish for many years, probably 20 years, you know. Um, he still looks like a little baby to me, you know. Um, just a bright, bright, bright guy. You'll see him when he comes here, one of the smartest guys in real estate. So when you, when you get to see somebody, I remember he was a young man, and we have the president of Related New York now, Jeff Blau, another young man then, and to see these, you know, great minds in real estate grow uh, and become, you know, you know, the great titans, you know, that are going to lead the future, you know, it makes you feel um, that the country is in good hands. Um, at Blackstone, John quickly moved into a newly formed real estate private equity group and became the co-head co of the real estate group in 2005. Given his 24-year career at Blackstone and his extraordinary record of success as the firm's global head of real estate, it is not surprising that industry observers now view John as the likely successor to lead Blackstone after Steve Schwartzman, another great friend and superman in, the, in this business, steps down. As Schwartzman noticed in an, noticed in an interview last year, he searches for individuals who demonstrate resiliency and grit, and that, quote, John has a real gift. Schwartzman also said, to be hired at our place and work with us, you have to be nice. And if you know, if you know Schwartzman, he really means that, you know. John meets all those, you know, characteristics. He has great qualities as a person and tremendous work ethic and tremendous intelligence. His, his charitable contributions in education and healthcare are especially noteworthy, noteworthy. As John and his wife, Mindy Gray, founded the Basser Research Center, which focuses on cancer prevention, treatment, and research of genetically inherited cancers. John attributes Blackstone's success to a single strategy. They earn great returns for their investors mostly pension funds, by following the motto, buy it, fix it, sell it. There must be more than that, and we count on Howard Lerber, president and CEO of the Vector Group, to get to the heart of Jonathan Gray's strategies. Vector is one of the largest publicly traded companies based in Miami. Its holdings include stakes in the luxury-focused Douglas Elliman residential brokerage firm that has been a presenting sponsor of this conference since it began. Vector's holdings also include the Morgans Group, the Landenberg Thalman Investment Bank, and numerous significant commercial projects both in Miami and in New York. Howard ran his own consulting and actuarial firm before joining Vector, where he now presides over a company that is one of the best kept seekers in Wall Street. Vector earned over $1.5 billion in 2014 in revenues and has a market cap in excess of $2.5 billion. Howard's skill has allowed it to pay a significant cash dividend each year for the past 20 years, despite the fact that many of Vector's positions are inherently volatile. And everyone here knows how volatile real estate is. Well, um, I'm going to cut it short and leave it to these two extremely um, gifted individuals. So please give a warm welcome to Jonathan Gray and Howard Lord. Tell me, are, okay. we, are you blocked this way? Yeah, are we better off we'll if we come? We'll go to the other side. Okay, other side. Yeah. Okay. It's like a 
group therapy session. Yeah. I want to thank George, though, to start. That was overly generous. I wish my wife and kids were here to hear that. So we'll anyway. send you. We'll send you a tape. I'm sure it's tape. Well, it's great to be with you, John. As we were just talking before, I was lucky enough to be involved in a transaction with John over 10 years ago. And uh, then when I heard you became the head of the area after I assumed it was because of the transaction that you did uh, you know, together. And I will say, we sold too cheap, and he, that means he bought it very inexpensively and did a great job with it. It was a hotel company, which is a whole different experience for me when I, you know, when I was involved in that company because I never knew that you could actually lose money before debt service until I was in the hotel business. <laughs> and hopefully that doesn't happen too after. So John, how did you start off? You went right from college into, uh, into Blackstone. So uh, how did well, that happen? Yeah. Well, I know there are a lot of students here. And I think sometimes people feel like, oh, I have a clear path. I know where I'm going to go in life. I had no idea I was going to end up in real estate. I grew up in suburban Chicago. I went to Penn for college. I made a good decision, which was to get a dual degree in finance and stay in the college as an English major, because I met my wife in a romantic poetry class. And a couple weeks later, I got a job working for a small investment and advisory firm called Blackstone. And so I'm still with the same woman, and I basically have the same job. But when I started, I started on the corporate side, in private equity um, and in the advisory business. And about a year into it, it was the early 90s, there was a lot of distress in real estate. Many of the people here will recall that. And Pete Peterson and Steve Schwarzman decided to go into real estate. They found a guy in Chicago, John Schreiber, who's a wonderful person. And they started on this venture to start a real estate business in Blackstone. They just didn't have any junior people. And they asked me. And I signed up because it was going to be all principal investing. And I didn't really love the advisory business. And I had the good fortune to grow up in the business at the same time. And that's sort of my story. And I really have, from the day I joined the real estate business, I've loved it. So I think it was good fortune more than anything. My dad was good fortune. I think you know uh, you did it and you helped to it, and so it's fantastic. So, how the the real estate business at that time was relatively small as a percentage overall of uh, Blackstone. Well, when businesses. I joined it, it was basically non-existent, non right. and um, and it's grown obviously to be quite large today with 94 billion of equity under management. If you include the debt on the properties, we probably own. It's probably close to $175 billion of assets around the world. So it's grown a lot. But you're much more now than uh, sort of an investment management you know, business, uh, much more into operations and so forth. And how was that transformation? Was that out of need? Um, I would say that you know, if you, you think about our business, we manage large pools of capital, primarily for public pension funds. And our job is to deliver great returns for them. And the question, really the pivotal thing in our business was in the early 2000s when we started buying larger public companies along the lines of the transaction we did together. Um, we stumbled on this idea that we could buy better quality real estate. We could do it in scale. Um, we could attract really great management. And we figured out that if we did that, we could make large bets, concentrated bets and themes we liked. So, what we decided was what we need to do to deploy large amounts of capital is find themes we like and get great management teams. So in the crisis, coming out of the crisis, you know, we liked U.S. housing, which I'm sure we'll talk about, and we built a management team. We liked uh, pan-European logistics. We built a management team and went all in. We did the same thing in India around the office building business, in Japan with apartments. When we find something we like, we put a lot of chips on the table, and we have a great team. Because in order to create value, it's not enough to just allocate capital. Being able to create value at the, at the business level makes a huge difference in terms of total return. So the business has evolved from just sort of investing to a much more active role, as you described. So what's your typical day? I mean, how much do you, I'm sure it changes from day to day, but how much time do you spend on each of the things you do? And then I'm sure also there's a portion on being out there raising money. Um, my typical day is long, I would say. Um, Part of the problem is when you have folks on the ground in Europe and Asia, you can always be working, um, Latin America as well. Um, I'd say it's a mix. You know, today's a good day. I was in three different cities in Florida. I uh, saw some real estate along the way. I saw some of our investors along the way. 
I obviously talk to people around the world, different offices, things going on, transactions, other things that come up. Um, the, the fundraising is clearly an important part of the business because without capital, you can't operate. Um, but I'd say we always remember that the most important part of the business is delivering great returns for our investors. It's not very complicated, right? One of the questions people ask is, how did you get to be so large? We got to be so big because we've delivered great returns. 17% net over 25 years to the investors in our global funds. And we, yeah, and, and that's the thing we can never lose sight of. So from my time perspective, I've always got to spend a majority of my time thinking about investing capital. The other part of it that I think is really important, and you can't um, overstate its importance, is your people. And so the management side and making sure you're doing right by your talent, growing talent, retaining talent, is also an important part of the business. But clearly the investing side is where I spend the bulk of my time. Yeah, it's a, it's a key point you touched on. I know I've said that for years. You know, it, it seems like for business, for a business deal, whether it's real estate or corporate deal, you could sort of always find the money. What you can't find is the people. That's the tough part. So if you're lucky enough to find a few good people, that's the difference between uh, failure and success. I, I would agree with that. And I think for these investment businesses, one of the challenges for investment businesses is are they just about an individual or a small group of partners, or are they institutions that can endure? and that can continue to perpetuate themselves because you've trained people in the right way, you've created the processes, you've created a broad network of relationships, and, and because of what you've done, the business can grow and it can continue to maintain its quality in different geographies and with different people and positions. And one of the things I think incumbent in my job is making sure we're training people in the right way, creating the right culture so that this business can continue to succeed over time. So how was it going into 08? Was it a panic mode? Uh, you know, you always get the feeling that an institution like Blackstone, there's no panic. It's always very calm and serene, as opposed to smaller places where people are. I used to have hair before that time, you know, yeah. and you're pulling out your hair. It just seems it's be interesting to hear what the experience is like during the bad times as opposed to the good times. Everybody, when, when times get difficult, feels the stress, particularly if you feel like your job is to deploy capital and deliver good returns, and you're taking significant write-downs on your investments. So uh, setting the stage, we had bought Hilton in 2007, and by some point in 2008, uh, we'd written down the investment by 70%, more than $6 billion of investor capital. The thing that kept me and others calm were virtually all of our losses were unrealized. And, and the lesson of the crisis, and, and any time you're heading into a difficult period, is you just don't want to be forced to sell at the wrong time. So for us in our real estate business, our two major holdings were what we owned of equity office that we hadn't sold off, which were primarily coastal buildings in New York and Boston and West Los Angeles and Northern California and Hilton Worldwide. Two great businesses, collections of assets. And we knew we had time on the debt, we had reserves in our fund, and we fundamentally believe that what had occurred was cyclical in nature, not the end of the world. And so, you know, one of the things I'd say as an investor, the key is to make sure your liabilities and assets are match funded. The danger is you have margin loans, you know, the tide goes out and you're forced to sell at absolutely the wrong moment. So I think that the thing that kept us calm was we felt like we owned good underlying businesses, we had good capital structures, and we believe things would ultimately come back. And we didn't freeze, so what we did was we went out, in the case of everything we own, we went out and bought debt at discounts because we believed in the underlying companies. We spent a lot of time with the management teams, focused on maximizing value. Um, and by focusing on what are we going to do each day to, to you know, create value for our investors, and knowing that we had the right capital structures created a sense of calmness. But yes, everybody feels stressed. Did you feel stressed at the time? A lot. Yes. So I, I just think, and, and we're in a period today, I'm sure we're going to talk about it, where obviously there's a lot of volatility in the screen, and the immediate sort of human reaction is to pull back on things and to panic. And, and yet, as investors, what you want to do is try to maintain some sort of equanimity so you can see things, because if prices of things have fallen, I always find it fascinating that short interest in the stock market is maximum in March of 2009 when the Dow Jones is at 6,000. 
you know, now people are all nervous about China and Europe and whatever. After the market, the global index is now down 20%. So I, I, as investors, you want to try to maintain a sense of calm, focus on the underlying fundamentals, and that'll make you better to weather what's invariably there'll be volatility out there. Well, you know, a good example, I think, of what you're talking about is having the liquidity to be able to hold on, which has been the beauty of the real estate business. The families, uh, like if you take New York City, the families, the family wealth that has been built up over the years were people that were very low leverage yeah. as the assets went up, and they stayed low leverage. And I would add to that for us, uh, George mentioned buy it, fix it, sell it. We don't really develop anything. Our whole business for the most part, is trying to buy hard assets at a discount to replacement cost. I know a lot of folks in this room like to build. We would rather have somebody else do the heavy lifting and in a distress period potentially buy debt to get control or maybe buy through a public company. We, we, we bought the Cosmopolitan Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, which was built for over $4 billion, foreclosed on, and we were able to buy it for a billion seven. That, for us, is what we'd prefer to do. And of course, development when you hit a storm often is much tougher because you don't have income coming in, you're spending money, leasing up that building, selling condos in a difficult environment is tough. And I think that's another reason why we've had better success in the down periods. Yeah. I mean, uh, the uh, EOP portfolio was a great example because you were, did a great job in selling off a piece of that portfolio to the next developer or owner who didn't do so well and lost most of those properties because he had to sell them. Right afterwards, and then the next guy came in and made a great buy, and now he's going to make a lot of money. Yes. I, look, if, if you, for a place like Miami, I think most people in this room are believers in Miami. I'm a believer in Miami. I'm a believer in the state of Florida. Um, the, key, <laughs> the, the key here is having the staying power, because you know fundamentally here um, creating new supplies is difficult. Land is tight. It's a dense place, and people want to come here, live here, work here, visit here. So what, when you hit these rough patches, you just need to make sure you have the capital structure, the wherewithal to get through it, and not be forced to sell at that wrong moment. Yeah. Well, surely on the residential side, that's changed so much since, you know, 08, 09, is you sort of can't get too leveraged because you're not getting big enough construction loans for that to happen, and you have to do, everyone's doing pre-sales, you know, with substantial deposits, not the small deposits they had before. So the project doesn't really even get going until there's a certain amount of sales. So it's, it's, it's almost, you know, from the, from the perspective of looking back, I think it's a good lesson, but it sort of can't happen again the way it happened in the last go-around in Miami here in South Carolina. I would agree with that. I mean, almost everywhere, if you want to feel better about the real estate business today, the amount of leverage in the system overall is just much lower. If you look at the commercial mortgage-backed securities market in 2007, it was $230 billion of issuance. Um, Last year was at 100 billion. This year may even be lower, given the volatility. So, when you think about things that cause trouble in this business, too much leverage is often um, one of the reasons. And I think you're right; we don't have that today. So, one of the uh, markets you went into after that downturn, or sort of during the end of it, was single-family homes. And I know you have a big portfolio. Was it 50,000 or yes, 50,000? Tell us about that. So how do you um, even find 50,000 yeah, pounds to buy them? I mean. Yeah. Well, I would tell you, you need a, a, a global financial crisis for that to occur. Um, we, if you think about our model, try to buy hard assets at a discount. You're sitting around in 2011. You're saying, where is there a large pool of assets uh, that are going to be sold by financial institutions um, at big discounts to underlying replacement costs? And it was pretty obvious it was single family homes. Um, it was pretty concentrated. Um, this state probably had as much as any place, but Phoenix, Las Vegas, Southern California, a bit in Chicago as well, Atlanta. Um, and we said, wouldn't it be great if we could buy these homes um, and ride what we think will inevitably be a recovery? Because the U.S. population continued to grow, and yet construction of homes dropped by 80% at the bottom. And so invariably, we thought there had to be a recovery in home prices in order for new construction to continue. And so uh, our thesis was that if we did it in scale, and one of the competitive advantages of our business is we do things that are very large. Um, and at the time, we couldn't get much bank financing. We said, let's go out and buy homes. There were all these post-foreclosure sales. Let's put people on the ground, but let's do it in concentrated markets. We picked 13 markets around the US. Initially, we started west, then moved east. 
Let's buy these homes. Let's spend 25000 or so fixing them up. And then let's rent them out and make income-producing assets out of them, like an apartment business, but just not in one large complex. But if we do it in enough scale, we can do it efficiently. And let's build up a management team. And we went out and did that. Now, what went wrong, um, nobody's going to be surprised there. It costs more and took longer to renovate the homes. Um, no surprise there. Um, and, but the good news was pretty much everything else went better than we expected. What we saw was home prices have appreciated in a place like this much higher than the 3 or 4% we underwrote. Uh, we ended up getting financing that was much better than we anticipated. And we ended up leasing up the homes now to north of 96% occupancy. Because even to this day, um, we still have a shortage of housing being built in the US. Last year, we built a million homes. To keep up with population and household formation, you probably need a million six, which is why you see upward pressure on rents and values in houses across the country. So the real question now for the business is, how do we exit it? It's performing quite well. Some of the existing public companies have had some challenges, uh, primarily, I think, because they were trying to build the bike and ride the bike at the same time, raising money, buying homes, fixing them. Um, we're hopeful that the, the business we bring out will be fairly mature. It's got great geography on the West Coast and in Florida is our big concentrations. And we think we've created something that will be a long-term enduring business. So um, it was a case of when we started this four years ago, people did think we were a little bit crazy at the time. But again, we had the courage that we were buying $300,000 homes for $150,000 and that felt pretty good to us. And I think it's going to turn out really well for our investors. So you have that whole portfolio still in place. You have not exited anything. We have back. not exited the business. Uh, we've sold off a little bit at the bottom, some things we bought in bulk that didn't fit uh, uh, you know, geographically or quality-wise. About um, one-third of the homes are here in Florida, and Miami, I think, is actually our biggest market by value. So We've made a big bet on the state. We, we believe it will recover, and it's been doing so nicely. And all single-family homes. You didn't buy this, condos or packages. This is all single-family homes. Now, separate from that, we own about 50,000 multifamily properties across the United States, mostly suburban garden apartments we bought. Uh, we recently bought Stuyvesant Town in New York, which is the largest apartment complex in the US. Um, but this particular invitation homes business is all single-family. And when, when you look at the, you know, today and you look at the returns or what you, you know, your, when you mark to market your investment there, I assume pretty much the rental income was basically flat to expenses and all your profit is in the appreciation or did you actually have a, no, a return? No, at, at our basis, we, we've been able to produce a nice return on an unleveraged basis. Without um, appreciation. Without appreciation. We're probably at our, at our basis, oh, um, we're, at a, we're producing a double-digit leverage cash no. on cash on our cost basis. So it's, you know, part of that just reflects the time we bought those homes, which was very favorable pricing. Um, and, and now we're achieving good rents as well. That's great. So let's talk maybe a little bit about the market in general and what your thoughts are. Another not-so-good day. Yeah. You know, and which I still don't understand why, you know, when oil's too high, it's bad for the economy, and when it's too low, it's bad for the economy, and when it's in the middle, it's bad for the economy, and, <laughs> you know, it just doesn't make any sense, but maybe you could uh, yeah. comment. So, so we'll, we'll start big picture. What, what I think we're watching now is sort of the, uh, another wave ripple from our financial crisis going back uh, to 07, 08. Um, the, the Chinese, in response to that, watching uh, what was happening, the slowdown in the U.S. and then subsequently in Europe, um, moved aggressively to stimulate their economies and, and um, did a lot in the way of fixed asset investment, infrastructure and real estate. They built a lot of capacity in manufacturing. And of course, when you do that and you build up debt in your system and you build up excess capacity, at some point that's got to slow down. And that's what they're attempting to do now is shift from this heavy investment-oriented economy into a consumer economy. China is so big, it's having a big ripple effect. How is it impacting the world? Well, certainly emerging markets uh, in this part of the world, if you go south in places like Brazil in particular, but Chile, Colombia, they were digging lots of things out in the ground to help feed the demand in China. And not only were they 
um, has that demand now softened, but of course there was huge investment in incremental supply. And so you have lots of new supply coming online at the same time demand softening. Same story in the energy business because of the voracious demands of China in particular and other emerging market uh, uh, countries. We saw lots of investment in new supply. Now we're seeing demand slow a little bit. And of course, all this new supply is coming online with the shale revolution. That, of course, has spilled out into our credit markets because the high yield market in the US is about 25% exposed to energy and commodity companies. Now you've got financial companies, banks in Europe, people are worried about credit quality. In the US, you see the impact of all these currencies weakening and that hurting our manufacturing sector. Um, you see it in terms of travel now because it's very expensive to come to the United States. You're seeing big corporates in the US cutting back because they're seeing earnings pressure abroad. So all of this is slowing global growth. And the markets, though, are reacting as if we're heading into some sort of very bearish, very dark period of time. I'd say our view is we think this is clearly resulting in a, a slowdown in China. It will impact both US and European growth. But we don't foresee this year a recession. And therefore, what the markets seem to be doing may create some interesting opportunities. So if you think in our real estate world, triple B commercial mortgage-backed security spreads have gone from 325 over to 750 over, even though underlying real estate fundamentals are pretty good. Lodging stocks have gone down 40, 50 percent, anticipating a pretty harsh recession. Uh, some of the office-oriented, or the tech-oriented office companies have traded off 35 percent. So that, for us, can create opportunities again um, if we're willing to say, yes, we see a slowdown, but we don't see things as darkly as the markets do. So I think the markets are really concerned and jittery after the experience of 08, 09. And we saw this a little bit in 11 and 12. Markets react much more violently than they did in the past. Nobody wants to be the last one left behind. The other thing that's happening that I think is exacerbating things is large pools of capital in some of those countries that have been affected by commodities in the Middle East and elsewhere are now having to fund deficits at home and they're selling securities and that's putting more downward pressure on markets. Um, but we're seeing things that to us in places can look irrational. We run a mortgage REIT called Blackstone Mortgage Trust. Um, all it has is first mortgage debt, 65 percent loan to value. Um, today it trades at 85 cents on the dollar of its book value and it yields, I don't know, 12 percent. When you're in a period like this, nobody's paying attention. The baby gets thrown out with the bathwater and that can create opportunities. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge there are forces causing a slowdown and that, it, that there is some reason for some concern. I just think the markets uh, seem to be reacting maybe a little bit excessively relative to what's happening in mm -hmm. underlying economies. And I guess we could say that about uh, Blackstone stock. I read, I read an article, I think, that Steve uh, Schwarzman spoke about the way, in the way you would value the company. And if you valued it the way he believed you value it, which was very plausible, you know, when I read it, it would be about four times what it's trading at today. Yeah. So, so I think, um, again, we, as a company in the investment business, um, you know, where people have a very negative view of what's going to happen to asset prices, they express that in our stock. We look at our business and say, you know, it produced uh, over $3 of cash earnings, uh, which we pay out virtually all of to investors last year. I think we've said this year, even if um, uh, there's uh, no more uh, sales for the balance of the year, we'll produce effectively a cash dividend of a dollar, which implies a yield of somewhere between, I want to say, 5 and 13 or 14 percent, depending on last year, or if you think you're in a gruesome period this year. Um, and yet the market doesn't really care, because the market's just in a very, very nervous state. Today. Yeah, well, I mean, your peers are the same situation. Apollo, same thing. Every, all, everybody's yeah. in the same spot. So again, in this kind of market, there's just excessive caution. And, and if we bring it down to real estate, what I'd say is we still see pretty good underlying fundamentals in real estate in the US. Um, you know, the economy last year grew 2-4. It'll grow less this year. But new supply is still only running about 1%. Now, there are markets like Houston 
or uh, New York City hotels or DC apartments that are seeing more supply. But nationally, new supply is very low. And so we would expect to see this year still pretty good rental growth, occupancy cash flow growth. Um, with, with cap rates low, you're not going to see them go lower. Um, and with markets backing up, you know, you could see a year of very modest increases in value. But the idea that you're going to see a sharp decline with those kind of favorable fundamentals just doesn't seem sensible to us. Yeah, I, I think that's the case. I see it in our brokerage business that, uh, you know, when, when I get the calls, you know, well, we hear the market slowing down. And so I have a standard comment. Yes, the market for overpriced condominiums has definitely slowed down. Yes. And I think that's the best way to explain it because when, when, when we look at the data, you know, uh, I, I think I looked at the third quarter. You know, we, we looked at all the listings, everything we had for sale on the market, and about 52% sold at about asking price, some a little bit above. And then when you looked at the other 48%, it all had one thing in common. They were all overpriced. You know, people had aspirational pricing, which, you know, happens in all markets at some point. It's, it could happen in the office market, in the retail market, you know. I, I do think the condominium market has, of anything, the high-end condominium market yeah. nationally is probably slowed. Because generally, those purchases are a little more discretionary. Do you need to buy that second home? Yeah. When there's this kind of volatility, you tend to pause, which is different than a rental apartment or a, you know, a grocery anchored shopping center. So um, for us, what we're hopeful of is the night, uh, what I'd say is our, our business model allows us to hold assets for very long periods of time, but allows us to move very quickly when opportunity presents itself. So um, I, I would say for us, I think in the U.S. and I think in Europe, given the pressure on the banking system, there'll be interesting opportunities that emerge from what's going on right now. Yeah. Well, we're seeing, it, you know, again, in the, in the condo market is, yes, at the very high end, and, and, and not just the high end per square foot, but the very high price that everyone was talking about, all these new buildings built, whether they're in, you know, Miami on the beach or whether in New York around the park, you know. It's the same thing in it, London and Hong Kong. Yeah, exactly. Globally, exactly. when markets dislocate like this, people get a little bit... Yeah. Uh, hesitant. I tell them, you know, there's, believe it or not, maybe hard for you to believe, but there are more $20 million buyers than $40 million buyers. There are more 10 than 20, more 5 than 10, and more 2 than 5. So there's no question when, when people are building just to the very high end, you know, there's going to be a slowdown. And especially with many groups out of the market now, like some of the Asians and the Russians after the sanctions, um, you're not seeing that money coming in. Yes. Although it was small anyway, it was not huge. You know, yeah. the way it was played up to Well, it be. tends to get more media attention. What's interesting yeah. is, um, going back to the earlier discussion, the, the basic residential business in the U.S., both single-family and multifamily, are maybe as strong as they've ever been because of the supply-demand imbalance there. And, and we're producing jobs in the U.S., and we're just not producing as many homes. And so broadly based, uh, you know, at $200,000 for a home, there are a lot more than $2 million as sure. well. And so... I think uh, you'll continue to see strength, and that's one of the reasons why um, we don't foresee a recession this year. Mm -hmm. So let's talk uh, maybe a little bit more just about Miami and Southern Florida, you know, and your thoughts on that, and also asset class. You're in every asset class, right? Yes. You know, there's no asset class you're not in. Pretty much. Right. So, what, so what's your thoughts about uh, Miami? Well, I would say generally um, we love great cities, where people, as I said, love to work and visit and, and uh, travel to live, whatever it is. And I think Miami clearly qualifies. It's the gateway to Latin America as well. Um, the city keeps getting better and better. Um, in terms of asset classes here, you know, I think the high-end condo business pauses in this kind of environment. Um, but I think just like we saw in the last downturn, ultimately it will recover because people want to be here. Um, I think the hotel business is a good business here. The challenge is there are an awful lot of hotel rooms under construction. I think after New York, Miami's got the second most under construction. And again, supply and demand. Um, that would probably make us more, you know, we're active in single family. I think rental housing, again, would be interesting. Um, uh, the office market here is pretty small, um, relatively. So, you know, that's probably not as much for us. And I, I would say shopping centers, warehouses, I think, are a great business in Miami, um, just given the amount of commerce done in this area and the density and the difficulty of getting space. And I, I think the shopping center business here is pretty good. Street retail, 
um, as the city continues to get better and better and more people live downtown is an area we would like. Um, grocery anchored shopping centers, all of that. So we would have a favorable bias, uh, continue to have a bias towards Miami. And, and in general, I'd say we like the state overall. As we talked about, low taxes, outside of Miami, a low cost state. I think you'll continue to see in migration. One of the things people don't focus on enough is just demographics. And one of the great things about Florida is the population continues to grow, which is very different from places like the Northeast and Midwest. And so I think the future here long term in Florida is pretty good. And I think Miami in, in, in particular, you'd like to try to buy real estate, um, but you'd like to, you know, ideally even during periods of volatility, hold it for a long period of time because I think the capital appreciation can be quite good. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Uh, what, you know, Miami, if, if you want to look right now and you say, okay, things have slowed down a little bit, you know, on the residential side, but the fact is it had such a big run, run up. And on good product, what we've seen pretty much, and if you looked at single family houses in Miami, like the top end ones on the water, Miami, those prices really never came down much during recession. They just didn't trade. You know, there weren't any buyers and, and, the, and the sellers weren't like anxious to sell. So they didn't sell. So the real fact is, I think probably the hardest thing to find today in Miami is a, is a lot, is a single family lot, on the water or off the water. They, they basically don't exist you know, anymore. Well, that's one of the great things. If you think about in real estate, places that are supply constrained are places you like to invest in. So Texas is a, a great state, but there's a lot of land in Texas. Land. And in Miami, it's pretty tough to build, everybody knows. So that scarcity value, uh, creates capital appreciation. That's a story in uh, Manhattan, that's a story in Cambridge, that's a story in San Francisco, West LA. If you think about long-term capital appreciation, places where it's very difficult to build, but where people want to live and work, those are good places to invest in. Yeah, yeah when it, whenever, there's, whenever it's difficult to do something, obviously it's hard to have an oversupply. And, and again, I think the changes that happened from you know, 08 and 09, really have stopped the possibility of it. And, and, and by the way, how would you describe like 08 on that? To me, it wasn't, really, it, wasn't really, it wasn't a real estate crisis. It was a financial markets crisis, wasn't it? It was, it was a financial markets crisis, but there was an awful lot of leverage in the real estate business. The epicenter was the residential business. The US residential was really the heart of the crisis, which caused the spill out. In commercial real estate, um, we had building, but not like we did in the late 80s, but we had too much leverage in the system. Going back, though, to the, the comment about Miami, I would make a more general comment about um, a powerful trend on sort of uh, reurbanization, which Miami is a beneficiary of. You know, if you think about what happened in America between sort of the mid-1960s, really through the early 2000s, um, most of urban America got worse. The quality of life went down. People fleed to the suburbs. There was much more growth outside of the cities. Um, something fundamental is happening. And it's happening here. It's happening in all sorts of the big cities. If you go to Chicago, right, ConAgra, United Airlines, choose to move back downtown. GE announced last week, right, they're leaving Connecticut, suburban Connecticut, to go to the seaport in Boston. Look at New York City. If I would have told you 10 years ago that if you go three miles west of the city to northern New Jersey, there'd be 25% vacancy in the office market and $20 rents. But if you went three miles to the east, to Brooklyn, there'd be 5% vacancy and $55 rent. You would have thought I was crazy. And, and what's happening is the gentrification of our cities, the power of these mobile devices, the sharing economy, people getting married later, all of that is leading people into these cities. And I think that's a powerful trend. As you think about it as real estate investors, I think I think it has a big impact on where you think about deploying capital, and I think a place like Miami will be a key beneficiary. So, so overall, and you know, in Blackstone's business, you know, you have you're in all the asset classes, you know, so private equity, you know, uh, real estate, everything. So, so when you're talking to uh, to existing investors or you're uh, out raising money for the different funds, are you are you talking about sort of the diversification of the different classes? that you're in for investors? Well, we're certainly talking to investors. I was in a meeting earlier today about where we see interesting opportunities across asset classes. So um, 
Today, generally, um, financial services are pulling back, right? Banks in the US and Europe are exiting a lot of activities, but those functions still need to exist, be they in auto loans or uh, second mortgages, reverse mortgages, um, construction financing in the UK. There are all sorts of things that people are exiting, and we're saying that's interesting. We're talking to investors about opportunities that all merge in the energy sector and commodity sector because there's so much distress, invariably, people will be for sellers in those businesses. In real estate, we're talking about places like Spain, where you saw a housing crash that was similar to what we had here, even more dramatic in terms of price declines and new construction down in Spain, 90, 95%, and we've been quite active there. Um, we're talking about credit markets, where spreads and corporate high yield or real estate debt, as I mentioned earlier, have gapped out in a big way. Um, we're talking about emerging markets that are trading off. We're always looking for places where um, pricing doesn't reflect underlying value. And the nice thing is because of the range of funds and the breadth and depth of the firm, we're able to take advantage of it. And there are very few firms, I think we're the only one in the world, that can do it in real estate and private equity and credit and hedge funds, all these different asset classes. And it gives us a really unique view of the world. One of the questions, you know, how have we been able to maintain our edge, and I do think the information we get in real estate off of our existing global portfolio, but from the firm as well, from what we're seeing, is very helpful, because we're always trying to translate that into where's the puck going, where do we see things a little bit differently than other people do. You know, I was looking at my iPhone earlier, you know, during a day on CNBC, about your news, and talked about, you know, the market's down, people are worried about, the, you know, where to put your money. So at the end of the day, when you really think about it, and we're involved with uh, an international uh, brokerage firm that we're partners with, Knight Frank, which is you know in pretty much 55 other countries that we're not in because we're only in the United States. But at the end of the day, we track you know the money, we track the sentiment, we rank the cities as to you know as to where people want to live, safety, politics, you know, and it's pretty much been pretty simple. Like you know, number one for years has been London, number two has been New York City. But then in the top 10 now has always been, in the last number of years, Miami and LA. So you have the major cities, you know, the major gateway cities. And at the end of the day, when you, know, you, you start thinking about it, and people were worried, oh, with the uh, Asian markets collapsing, you know, that's going to stop the Asian money from coming in. And quite the opposite, um, because we do a lot of business you know, in, uh, with uh, investments from China and, and the rest of Asia that what we saw was just the opposite. They weren't worried that they may have lost 30% because the market went down there. They were more worried about having safety for the 70% they had left and were more anxious to make investments primarily in real estate in the US. Well, I would say if you think about real estate as an asset class in this kind of environment, there is um, a lot of attraction to the yield it offers and the nature of hard assets. Right. And um, I think you will see some changes in capital flows because some money will come home, maybe harder to get money out of China. But in general, I, I do think uh, the U.S., places like London and Paris, Sydney, major cities in the world will continue to attract an awful lot of capital. And, and I don't really foresee that changing um, just because in a world with so much volatility, so much uncertainty, to own a great piece of real estate in these major cities that gives people a sense of calmness and they know they're getting a current return. And if you think about the hunt for yield, if you're in a world where the 10-year treasury pays you 1.7% and in Japan you get zero or negative now, Germany close to zero, owning a building that's yielding, be it in Munich or wherever it is, has some attraction. So um, I do think you will see if we stay in this kind of very low uh, inflation, low interest rate environment, Capital for stable, more core real estate will be pretty sticky and will mean the prices for those assets should hang in there. Now, more volatile assets with higher risk in that kind of environment may see some widening out in pricing. But I do think for great stable, stabilized real estate, there'll be a very strong bid. And so in our business, the idea of taking something that has some risk associating with it, fixing it up, leasing it out, and creating a more bond-like asset, you can generate outsized returns doing that. You know, to me, though, I look, at, you look every day at what's going on. And you know what's the beauty of owning real estate versus 
equities? Tell me. You don't know how much it goes down every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, I, you, it, it's, it's less stressing watching CNBC <laughs> because they don't say, oh, you know, the commercial real estate went down 3% today as markets crashed in, you know, Asia and Europe and so forth. But, you know, if you're in equities, that's what they're saying every day. And, and what's the, what I'd add to that, though, is what's interesting is we do have a public REIT market here in the U.S. and around the world, but it does not necessarily correlate right. with the underlying private market, sure. and that can certainly create opportunities. We, in the second half of last year, did four privatizations of public REITs. The largest was a life science office company based primarily with focus Boston, Cambridge, and in California. And we were able to buy it at what we thought was a much better cap rate than we could buy those assets in the private market. So um, being able to navigate that and knowing what the assets in the private market are trading for relative to where the stocks are can create real opportunity for our investors. And again, there just aren't that many people who can write the kind of size checks and, you need. And, and you know, maybe because, you, you know, it's funny, but you know, people always talk about liquidity. But maybe because the real estate doesn't have the exact same liquidity as equities do, maybe in a lot of cases that's better because there's a less emotional decisions being made um, that you may make today when you see your equities going down. You're not going to get out of your real estate, you know, by making one phone call and say sell. And that holds you in. And if you believe in the long-term viability of it, you're actually better off. Yes. I also think people with their real estate, you know, as we talked about earlier, what forces them to sell is when there's too much leverage. So, um, I, you know, if people are saying, if you're sitting around saying, how nervous should I be? When we think about what could cause you to get really nervous about your real estate generally, we think about um, cranes, how much new supply there is of an asset class. That's definitely top of our list. We think about the amount of capital, um, which is, is the debt market overheated and driving prices to unsustainable levels. I don't think either of those conditions exist. And then you can think about a contraction. Are we in a recession heading into that? That can certainly damage, uh, dampen demand for real estate. And again, we don't see that. But we certainly in a period of much more moderate growth than when we were coming out of this. And so you have to manage your expectations lower. But definitely, as you've been saying, you definitely don't want to panic here. Well, I think that's great. Uh, let's open it up to questions. Does someone have a microphone? And let's take some questions. How do you envision this market filling out in the next 24 months when it relates to those foreign buyers having to complete the purchases? Yeah. So the question, for those of you who didn't hear, the first half was about um, the condo market here um, and the foreign buyers. I think it puts pressure on the market, right? I, I'm sure, I think the good news is versus the last cycle where they put up small percentage of capital. Uh, of the purchase price, plus they often had a right of rescission so they could get that money back and essentially the developer was stuck with the unit. If you put up 50% of the money, I don't care if the price goes down 20%, you're not going to walk. Now they may want to remarket that asset and take some sort of loss. I think that will put some pressure on the market. That would be my expectation. But I think it'll be much better than what we saw last time because there was much more leverage in the system. So. And as I said, I think long-term prices will recover on an absolute basis. The Miami prices are not very high. Uh, but I do think the next couple of years will be choppy just because these foreigners, particularly from Latin America, who've seen their currencies go down by 25 to 50 percent, they may need those dollars back in their home country. Um, and generally, buyers from the U.S. may be a little more cautious given what's happened in markets. But I, I would say softness, but not nearly as bad as we saw last time. Someone back there? So given your, your reach and the size of your portfolio, you obviously have a, access to a tremendous amount of information, and you have access to trade publications. How do you, as an investor, block out all the noise and filter what you pay attention to to make investment decisions and see the forest through the trees? It's a great question. Everybody gets influenced, you know. You stare at that screen on your mobile device and you see all that red and invariably it makes you vibrate. Um, I, 
I, I would say um, what, what you're trying to do is, is just separate the noise, the headlines, the negativity, and look at the underlying data. For me, that's what I've always found to be most powerful, which is, okay, you know, everybody's terrified about energy prices, it's horrible, but how much supplies being, is online today? How much depletion will there be? And where has demand been historically? And what's a reasonable forecast? And I would say if you just go to the underlying data, it would be the same thing in the Miami condo market. Historically, how many units have sold? What have the average prices been? If we're in a tougher economic environment, what will that go to? And, and that gets you away from the headlines. Um, I think when you just focus on the headlines, you know, what I found interesting in the financial crisis is there were a bunch of deals that had gone bad in 08 or 09, but because of low LIBOR, you know, later maturities, they, they ended up going bankrupt in 2010 and 11 or whatever. But the problem had occurred early on, and then when they got into trouble, people said, oh, the market's getting worse, when in reality, the prob problem had happened two or three years earlier. So I guess my advice would be to just look at what's happening on the ground, look at the facts, you know, in real estate, how much square footage is being added, how much is being absorbed, what's happened to price over time, what's reasonable to assume, and, and to me, that's the best. And, and the headlines can work to your favor because people get so panicked, you know, oil falls to $26 and now they're worried about it falling to 10. Meanwhile, when it was $110, they didn't worry about it going to 100. So I, I think you just need a certain ability to separate the noise from the facts. Another question? Um, there's a lot of discussion about walkable infill market, the growth in districts, whether it's Brooklyn or Coconut Grove, um, many examples we can name. Can you talk to the access to capital? If you see capital connecting with what we call the missing middle, the main street infill building that may be a little bit smaller scale, maybe four story, six story. Um, I know many individual stories of folks who have a hard time getting those financed because uh, they're too small. And can you talk to that? Because whether it's a single owner of many properties in a district that have a number of smaller projects or whether they're the smaller organic, um, we might call it developer, um, are they going to be able to access capital? I, you know, I think in this market, people, there is capital out there. I mean, I, you know, our business, the scale, both in our debt business and equity business is much larger than those type of assets. But I think there's an attraction for individual investors, smaller institutional players, smaller private equity players to find good infill real estate uh, opportunities. So if anything, I'd say the challenge has been more in the bigger things just because it's hard to find really large pools of capital who are willing maybe to take on risk. Uh, our historic experience today in these markets, particularly places like New York and Miami, is there's a lot of entrepreneurial capital who'd like to make those kind of investments. So I think it exists. I know the financing today is probably harder to come by than it's been in the past, but I actually think the equity side, it's out there today. People are up for taking those kind of investments. Yeah, I would agree. I think the equity is easier to find in many cases than the debt. I have a more of a personal slash management question for you. First of all, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. It's been a pleasure to hear you speak. Um, I've actually heard that you keep your calendar fairly open um, and, uh, and that surprisingly you are accessible. Uh, and, and given the fact that probably everybody in this room receives a couple hundred emails a day and a couple dozen phone calls, I'm sure you receive multiples of that. So my first question is whether that's true or not. And the second is just... Can you give us some thoughts on how you manage uh, your organization, the enterprise of running a real estate company, not just the actual transactions themselves? Well, I wish my schedule was more free. I, I, I would say, um, for me, the challenge is that um, I'm finding myself increasingly booked up with things I need to do, um, and, and that makes it harder. And when I go to places, you know, if I'm in Asia or I'm in Sao Paulo or London, I mean, my calendar is pretty... Booked, but, but I think it's important um, to always be responsive. So I have a policy wherever I travel to that by the end of the day, night, that I re return everybody's email. Now, sometimes I say, I'll get back to you. I need to read this. But I want to be responsive to people around uh, the world. Um, but it makes for a very full day from the moment I get up to the moment I go to sleep at night. 
Um, in terms of managing the enterprise, I think the key thing is to have people you know, like, and trust who you work with. And I'm fortunate to have a lot of people like that who care a lot, who are driven, um, and you can rely on them to do a lot of things. And then, you know, continually making sure we run an integrated business in terms of our, our calls, our, our meetings, strategy sessions, we bring asset reviews, constantly bringing our people together so we're communicating so that everybody knows we have the same standard of care everywhere around the world. So um, for me, it's high responsiveness and then having a really integrated business where people are moving around the globe, people are traveling, and people are regularly communicating. Because the danger of a big business like ours is you get siloed, you get bureaucratic, you don't communicate, and you lose what made you special. And, and to me, I'm, I'm totally focused on not allowing that to happen. And I think part of it is I genuinely enjoy what I do. I think the people I work with do as well. And that's the only reason you would do this. Because why would you do this 24-7? Because it's fun. Because it's interesting, because it's challenging, because you meet interesting people all around the world. And I think if you have a passion for something, it makes you better at it. And so for me, I love the people. I love the business. Um, and I don't view it as work, even though at times it can be a little overwhelming. I think we have time for one more question. There's someone over here. Josh, you had a venture you that invest in either really big companies or really big assets. And going into the residential play for the first time, I think that your firm really went after a lot of little assets. Uh, trend there, or uh, you know, I know you like to make most decisions on credit. Yeah. How are you going to do Well, I would say. With, we've done things with little assets in grocery anchored shopping centers, um, select service hotels. But when you do things, you can't make every individual decision when you're buying 50,000 homes. But you can establish parameters um, and say, this is what we believe. This is the kind of discount to replacement costs. These are the kind of geographies. So yes, we like buying things like the Willis Tower in Chicago or major buildings in London or around the world. But if there's a theme that involves smaller assets where we can come up with the parameters, we're comfortable doing that as well as long as we have a management team who's aligned with us, who we know and trust. And so, you know, part of it in my business is you can't touch every single decision. You have to make some big decisions about themes uh, that you really believe in, but then work with people you trust and then go all in. And that would be my other basic idea, which is, if you believe in housing or if you believe in retail, whatever that theme is, people tend to be too hesitant, even though they know in their hearts it's something really good. We much prefer the idea of going all in when we have confidence in something. I think that is fabulous advice for everyone in the room, from students to people who have not been students for a long time. Thank you.